Hello. Before you settle into this week's edition of the podcast, I just wanted to flag a very special live webinar that I'm going to be hosting next week on Thursday the 16th of November at 2pm London time. Is shipping zero carbon transition back on track? That's the title. And while I'm sure regular listeners to this podcast are going to have some pretty strong views on the answer to that question, I can promise some insightful debate and very useful pointers in advance of COP28. So, please join us. I will be joined by Catherine Palmer, the shipping lead at the High Level Climate Champions, Tristan Smith, the Associate Professor in Energy and Transport and Director of UCL UMass Consultancy, Susan Ruffo, Senior Advisor for Ocean and Climate at the United Nations Foundation, and Helen Barden, Senior Solicitor at North Standard PNI. All voices that are featured on this podcast. So, please do join us on Thursday. It's free. Registration link in the podcast notes. And while you're thinking about the questions you want to pose to my expert panel, here's some food for thought in this week's edition. If it were possible to weigh the collective hot air expelled discussing shipping's future fuels against the expended efforts in actually improving the current efficiency of the industry, well, there would be a noticeably heavy imbalance. That's because the low-hanging fruit was picked several years back, and the nitty-gritty of overhauling contracts, investing in genuine digitalization, taking a holistic stab at integrating a global value chain, well, that's all quite tricky, and, of course, it's eye-wateringly expensive as well. For all of the hand-wringing about flawed efficiency approaches from the IMO in the Carbon Intensity Indicator, or CII, the real issue is the fact that the commercial architecture of the shipping industry makes real efficiency very difficult to achieve. The split incentives between owners and operators and the industry's devotion to the asset game often make it challenging for solutions to known problems to actually be implemented. Essentially, We're an industry that rewards inefficiency. Endlessly complaining about how the fuels you can't buy to run on engines that are not yet available are going to represent a fundamental shift in the economics of the business, well, that's all far easier than tackling the difficult but entirely achievable overhauls required to make shipping more efficient, rather than just low carbon. Anyway, I mention this in the context of this week's conversation because I had the honour of attending the Anassis Prize Lectures this week. This is where a faculty of international academics gathered in London to debate their research into the state of shipping and global trade. And clearly, the climate debate, along with the threat of deglobalisation, that came up in conversation once or twice. For those of you not aware of the Anassis event, this is essentially the maritime trade equivalent of the Nobel Prize. They are awarded every three years by the Anassis Foundation, London Bay's Business School and its Costas Graminos Centre for Shipping, Trade and Finance. One of the three winners this year was Professor Siri Pettersen Stradness of the Norwegian School of Economics, who was honoured by a panel of academics for her substantial body of work, which includes research into maritime freight rates and the impact of environmental regulations on shipping. Now, clearly, I could not pass up the opportunity to have a chat with her, but I also managed to bag that other rock star of maritime economics, Professor Martin Stotford, who joined Siri for this week's conversation. So I'm going to start with Martin, who's been applying his considerable academic firepower towards the big questions of the day for decades. And he thinks that the current big question is what to do about the green energy gap for the period up until the mid-2030s. This is a couple of years ago. I started, I thought, well, it would be good to find out how much the methanol really costs. You know, we were hearing about people ordering methanol ships and... So I, um, and I actually, I'm a quite, I've been for 30 years an investor in a wind farm and I, um, uh, I worked with the guy who um, set that up and we came up with uh, an offshore wind farm estimate which um, is that to produce a, a big container ship doing 22, 23 knots uses about 200 tonnes of heavy fuel oil a day and um, that's equivalent to about 400 tonnes of methanol on a, an energy content basis. And to produce 400, enough electricity to generate, to synthesise 400 tonnes a day of methanol, you needed um, uh, 30, um, 
12 meter offshore turbines operating at average figures and I got all these costs off a of very very detailed website that and I spoke to the consultants there and I'm pretty sure I'm the first shot I came at, it was 36, 10 metres, and then the last year, end of last year, I took another look and they said, well, maybe you should do 30, 12 metres now, and that would cut the cost from a billion dollars to about $850 million. And in addition, to run the site of the 30 thing is about $60,000 a day. Um, and so that's just the electricity you then got to get the electricity ashore, synthesize it. You've got to combine it with carbon dioxide, which, as far as I can understand, costs at least 300 If you buy carbon dioxide, it costs $300 a ton. Mm. Um, and then you've got to dis distribute it to the ship. And you heard what... Um, you know, I, I was quoting figures of th maybe $3,000 a ton. And... Um, the, um, the, the Mr. Dr. Papa Dimitri, Dimitri this morning was saying, no, it's not, it's $6,000 a tonne. Mm. Um, I, I never did quite nail down the, the methanol synth synthesization mm. cost, but that's, that's the background. Mm. Well, there may be a few calculations still to go there, but effectively we're talking about an increase in cost there of around four to six times what we're currently paying. And that's a fundamental shift in the economics of the industry by anybody's measure. A historical note pointed out by the academics in the room, by the way. The hike in price that Martin's talking about there is about the same as the increase from the oil shock in the 1970s, where it increased by a factor of around six from the bottom of 1972 to 1980. Although in that instance, there was a massive substitution into coal, of course, which is not going to happen today. So the economics are a little bit different. And of course, you had a huge oversupply of ships at that time. So the cost was not paid directly by the consumer. I digress. One of the main contributions that Professor Siri Pettersen Stradness won the Onassis Prize for was her work developing the theory behind port arrival slot auctions and how a fully functioning system could dramatically improve the efficiency of the whole industry. So this, this virtual arrival, it's a very nice thing uh, and, in, and you could calculate it, not 100% because of weather and things like that, uh, but you could make the waiting, sitting, waiting for, for uh, the port access less and thereby also reduce the speed on the way up. Mm. But then you need an, another kind of, of uh, clauses in, in the contracts with, uh, with the charter or with the cargo owner uh, because of this, um, this um, uh, period when you are slow steaming but should be in the port. Uh, th then you have the demerge uh, issue coming in. It's a way of having uh, that, that you can a bid for a specific time slot mm. and that in theory has been solved in auctions but the practical implementation still lags. Ideas like Blue Visby and the efforts to stop the standardised operational practice of sail fast then wait are of course now part of the industry debate and we have serious work to thank for that. Eradicating sail fast then wait will allow ships to reduce speed, thereby reducing carbon footprint of the maritime industry by about 15%, or overall 45 million tonnes of CO2, so I'm told. So while we're collectively fretting about the efforts to raise trillions of dollars of R&D funds to catalyse a new generation of sustainable fuels and cutting-edge digital technology, all of which is necessary, it might be worth considering why we're not really prepared to tackle the charter party agreements that aren't fit for purpose and that are decades, if not centuries, out of date and effectively reward the inefficiencies of the way the industry's trade law is set up. Back to Martin and that question of the near-term actions required versus the longer-term options. You, you, point, you have pointed out over numerous years now that you know, the industry is fixated I guess on, on the fuels and the engines and you know we should according to MAN be able to order an, an ammonia engine by the end of 2024. Mm -hmm. I was told I spoke to the CEO of MAN a few days ago with Trafigura they, they are very confident that they can get something on the water imminently. Uh, your point is well that may be the case but you can't get the fuel and actually 
if you were looking at this logically, you would be looking at all of the ways you could improve the efficiency of the shipping industry now rather than in five years' time. Again, a gap between the rhetoric and the reality. Do you, is the industry focusing on the right thing as far as you're concerned? Well, I think you've summarised pretty well what I was going to say if you'd asked me the question. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, hold that thought. Um, I mean, one of the... Um, the, the, uh, there isn't as, I don't think there's as much urgency as people are, um, you know, people feel hyped up to solve the problem tomorrow. But this is going to be a long run, you know, it's a marathon race, not a, a, a sprint. And um, you can only do what, you can, what the technology is there to do. And, I mean, you've, you've mentioned um, MAN and, uh, you know, seem quite confident that they can produce a dual-fuel engine. No reason why they shouldn't. It's not, it, it's fine-tuning, it's a very well-established technology, and it brings in some cryogenics and things. Um, but if you follow... Um, the sort of Peter Drucker uh, thought that, you know, what you should be doing is, is not predicting the future, but doing things that you can do today to prepare for the future. And I, I mean, really, there's not much you, you can do about what the shipyards will offer you in five years' time. That's something you have to take as it comes. Um, I think what you can see happening is this sort of um, tightening focus on the performance of the industry, which the IMO seems to be ratcheting up. Not everybody agrees that it's effective, but the CII is a direct, um, you know, a, 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 a direct development of earlier ideas, and it's very specific. It's simple. You simply have to record carbon, and you relate that to the transport work done. And there's 146 states which are nominally signed up to port state control and who are sharing databases and sharing information and I have no one of the main things that the port states do is look at paperwork that's the one thing you are absolutely allowed to do is you go on board and look at the paperwork and whether the paperwork is there and satisfactory and it's quite you know in terms of reporting carbon unless they change the CII and the time scale, then it's going to be very difficult um, to get away without some sort of adverse grading. And as far as the, as we heard a lot this morning about the discussion of big companies and so forth, but the, the, very, the big charterers are not going to be able to accept ships without a, a respectable grade. So I think that um, the, that's a, a sort of long run into the conclusion that if I was a ship owner today, I would be investing in building my business and organisation so that I had the digital capability, the logistics capability, and the, um, the, 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 the whole, um, to pick up Siri's point this morning, the whole seafaring capability of people who are not just on board ship, but people are part of my whole business organisation. I mean, the average shipping company today has got um, probably ten times as many people on, at sea as they have in, on shore, and there's no interchange at all. And I think the, you know, the answer to this point Siri made very clearly this morning is we are the industry's relying on a small number of nations, which is being diminished. I mean, yeah. Ukraine and Russia, etc. Um, and this is, this is a historic thing. Um, but there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't have high-quality local people who work a bit in the office, go on board ship, maybe have smaller crews, strong digital communication between ships. And so if you put all of that together, then you, you, know, you can easily... Ten, ten years goes nowhere in business, and I would say you know, the big changes will come in the 30s. And... The next, the rest of this decade is just sorting out a business that's capable of coping with that, and there is not a lot of businesses able to do that today. On, on the road towards this, and as you picked up my, my comment on the seafarers, uh, the, the, the digitalization is going to help 
in that respect. And also, in, I didn't say it, but in one way, uh, it's positive that there are so few nations, and because then the industry is going to look at how can we can we be sure to have people on board. Then they will start hopefully to invest more in the people and this digitalization and support and better contact with shore will then help to have smaller crews uh, with a higher uh, educational level so that they can really exploit this which will be a decision support system on board so i think that is is a positive the other positive thing that uh, is happening and uh, is that we have seen slow st uh, slower steaming since 2008. So the, the, even though I said in my, my talk that uh, the theory isn't fulfilled totally, we have a history for the last uh, last 10, 12 years where it, where it really has shown that this uh, increasing uh, costs have reduced the speed. So in, in that way I'm, I'm agreeing with Martin, that the industry is doing these small steps towards the right thing. Mm. I, I, I'd argue that, in fact, this is clearly a very difficult thing to do. I mean, it's I gave my lecture about it, and it's eight years ago now, and I would say very few companies have got on top of digital technology, yeah. and I don't think you'll do it until businesses are really willing proactively to, to build up departments and staff and to produce information which is not going to make them money initially. But until you ha make that upfront investment and do it over a number of years and grow people, because you can't hire the people to do this, you know. Um, you, the, the, I, I think you have to be pushed by having problems getting crews. So that the number that are available will, will be lower. Oh, I, I think that's a bit disappointing to <laughs> say that because it won't happen. I mean, what happens if you can't get a crew? You either sell without them, <laughs> or you. Um, I mean, you know, the trouble is there is this great disconnect between ship and shore, and that is there because you couldn't communicate. Mm. That is no longer true. Mm. You can communicate now, mm. and the systems are slowly getting better but people you know the general psychology is no problem 150 million dollars for a vlcc no problem five million dollars to set up a digital department oh I no i don't we you know it's overhead isn't it for example in the offshore industry they have more they also have uh, crews from uh, more high uh, high income areas so i think we can see it starting but for the deep sea traditional, I agree that it's not uh, the first thing that we are going to see. But, but isn't, isn't it rather disappointing that you have to go to offshore to find an <laughs> example? And, you know, McKinsey, McKinsey has done endless studies on this and on land, less than a quarter of companies, and this is not very old surveys, three or four years old, less than a quarter of companies are actually managing to get projects, digital projects, out of the pilot stage. They have this concept of pilot purgatory, where you, you know, you set up the project mm -hmm. and then you try and roll it out. But there's so much resistance and lack of governance and lack of direction in the company, and so it never happens. Mm -hmm. And these are the realities. Um, and they are, I mean, I know from personal experience, you know, there is a lot of, of sort of things out there that w would make it very difficult for people to make these innovative initiatives work, you know? I mean, as you say, you've been talking about this for a long time, your initial lecture eight years ago, when we had this discussion, and you said at that point, there is no longer a technical barrier to most of this happening. What, what are the tipping points that we're waiting for to happen here? Is it regulatory? Is it the pain of companies not being able to compete, not get access to cargo or markets? Well, this is the, 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 I think part of the solution is something that's dear to your heart, <laughs> which is the IMO. We're a much vilified organisation, but what, strangely, I, I was updating the um, regulatory chapter of my book, and I went through the whole thing, and it's rather surprised me that when you go through it step by step, IMO strategy has has developed almost relentlessly and it's slowly narrowing down to a point where 
you can't not report the information about them because the CII, I mean, it's two things. One is you've got to report carbon emissions, yeah. and two, um, you, 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 you have to actually um, uh, do that in... Um, uh, sorry, I've lost my thread. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, you, uh, um, what's the second factor in the CII? Um, uh, You're thinking of the energy efficiency. Oh, it's, it, yeah, it's, yeah. It, they've related the carbon to the cargo carried. Yeah. Right. A very obvious thing. Mm. But, um, you know, that's, you know that, that's absolutely crucial because... You're slowly tightening the knot. And although I was just talking to someone out there who didn't, who said, "Oh, well, it's all going to get relaxed now." Mm. But um, you know, that's a pretty. Um, it's pretty well defined, the CII, and it's hard to stop once you started. Um, you seem not to be critical of the effects of the CII. This uh, that it, it uh, if you are. In an industry where you have long stays in port, and you have a, a worse situation, and also, the, as mm -hmm. I commented, uh, to to make your CII better, you should ballast longer, because you use less fuel when you have less weight. So to me, this seems that the, the CII is is having some flaws that will distort the picture. Ooh. But but what I think is is uh, uh, has been important in the, is the decision to put some end date and not because I necessarily believe that this is the way of that you will reach net zero in two thousand five. But it aligns the industry, it aligns the ship owners, it aligns the producers of of machinery, uh, and thereby there has been a big search to look at what can we do how can we do it mm. i think that is a good thing from from uh, from these decisions where, whereas this and also the reporting of your emission but hanging everything on this cii grading I, i'm a bit skeptical but the, the, the point that you made in relation to previous regulations the air care for example yeah. where you know the theory would suggest that ships were slow down in fact if anything you found them speeding up yeah. this unintended consequence of policy is often completely and misread in terms of the intention versus the end result. Yeah, yeah, because the incentives isn't always clear to those setting the rules and uh, to be, to, to be uh, not too clear about it. <laughs> and we heard it this morning also that uh, incentives can give, uh, if you don't, uh, don't analyze them, can give different results from what you expect. Mm. And that, yeah. but, but surely, I don't see how you can possibly claim that the CIA is not focused. In fact, it, it is absolutely nails thing down. So the, one, I mean, the objective of all of this is less carbon mm. per tonne mile of cargo. Mm. And it, you may have difficulty measuring it, mm. but with, there's no reason with today's technology why that shouldn't be eliminated. But the point is that you are actually... Um, it, leaving it, what you're doing is using something rather like the pricing mechanism to force the owner not to do in, go do trades where they're spending 48% of their time in port, mm. using energy and not not transporting anything. And you know this is this whole debate with the charters is is famous. You know they they want you to go at 70, 16 knots. Mm -hmm. And then wait yep, because it yep. suits them for their inventory better. Yes. But I, so I, I would I rest I would try a, try to support the case. I think that the CII may be difficult, but it is in doing the right thing. Uh, to have transparency in in emission, I think that's a good thing. So mm. that the uh, EEDI these different they they are fine. But what I dislike about the CII is the ranging A, B, C, D and then stopping from the, the you shouldn't charge uh, the worst uh, and if they are bad because of the measurement not being good I think that's a, a bad thing to have transparency on the mission is is, uh, is 
not my that's not my concern that's not a problem so do i misunderstand you or <laughs> well i mean i think in the end you have to keep your eye on the ball here and mm -hmm. the ball is less carbon per unit of transport yeah. and the cia aims at that the grading system everybody including the imo accepts is a a first step mm. and we also know that there's problems in collecting the information mm. but, but what struck me as I went through the whole thing is it's progressive and they are slowly tightening the noose mm. and I think the one thing that I, I'm very sure of is that if you just leave it as it is nothing will happen mm. and therefore you know they're doing the one thing they could uh, that was the first thing. And then the other thing that struck me as I went through all this in detail was, of course, that port state control is just the sort of thing that you can mobilize port state control with all its databases. I mean, the MOUs all exchange data. Mm -hmm. So when the ship's coming up, you can see, you will be presumably be able to see what carbon it's reported. Or if it hasn't reported, you can, you can do something about it. So I think this has struck me as a, a, a surprisingly powerful system. Okay. God bless the bureaucrats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, that's, that's a cynical approach. <laughs> and I think, I honestly, um, I, 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 I mean, the IMO gets an enormous amount of stick. And I have to say, I've done my own bit in the past. But, um, and it, but it, um, they are not bureaucrats. They're just um, trying to set some sort of mechanism which will achieve a target which they, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, talking to Mr. Metropolis in April 2018 and they were so relieved that they got that target through mm. Mm. Uh, with 175 members. Mm. You can't do much. But I think they deserve a bit of support. Frankly. Absolutely. And we've said it many times on this podcast before, you know, the IMO is nothing more than the collective will of 175 member state mm -hmm. governments. And, you know, we need to remember that in terms yeah. of how yeah. this debate progresses. And that is both a weakness and a, and a strength. Yeah. When, when they agree, it's a strength. So well, the point is, there's nothing else. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you take away IMO, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, well, if, as a theorist, of course, what I would suggest uh, is uh, to have a levy on, on, uh, on emission and uh, that have a levy on, on the fuel. Mm. Uh, that is, of course, what, uh, what the EU now is doing. But being a regional, that is, it can have very different effects. So it, we need to have it on a general basis. And and who that gets is back the money? to. And, that's the the first thing is who makes the decision and that of course had to be IMO uh, and uh, who gets the money that is uh, I mean, probably set up a fund for for uh, development uh, in um, innovations and research is one way mm -hmm. uh, and the other way is to to give it to because this will raise uh, freight rates and costs and then support countries that are, um, are especially hurt by this. Yeah. But that will destroy a bit of the effect. I, mean, I looked at this four or five years ago and <clears throat> couldn't see how, when you follow it through to the bitter end, how, mm. you, how you actually, in a way it's sort of interventionist, it's like the sort of issues that the, we, they were discussing this morning. And, uh, and if you want to set yourself up for unintended, unintended mm. consequences when there's large amounts of money slopping around, um, it's uh, it's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky one. The idea is, of course, the traditional on external effect that you should have the polluter pay. Mm. That, that's that's the effect that you wish to have from this. So who is the polluter, as the uh, as the good book says? That, that, <laughs> the polluter here eventually the here is the consumer. Yes. Yes. So you wish this levy to go through the system to the consumer. Martin, let me pick up on one thing that you mentioned this morning. You, you said the industry is still trying to search for a solution that sees zero carbon for zero cost to me. Do you think, going back to the company's responsibility, that, that there is still that either naivety or the gap between what they're saying and what they're doing in terms of uh, you know, the few options and the levers that they have available to them? Are they doing enough, do you think? I, I think the, 
I think they're doing what you would expect for an industry that for the last 30 years has been totally focused on cutting costs that are absolutely the bone. You know, you make 1% over LIBOR if you're lucky and uh, you get a, an infusion every so often. And um, But most businesses are geared up to cheap, low costs. And in fact, moving forwards, um, and completely changing tack and doing the sorts of things I'm talking about, like setting up more overheads and changing the way you run the organisation and hiring graduates to go on board ship and that sort of thing. That's um, You need to have religion quite seriously to do that. And I don't see that there, you know. And I'm not talking about just shipping. I don't see it anywhere, you know. We're all flying, you know, uh, we're all flying around the place and we've... How many people have really changed their um, the, the, their behaviour, except for maybe buying um, an electric car, which is probably burning marginal electricity that's produced with a coal-fired power station, yeah. you know? And that is where we should leave it this week, with the rationalist academics telling the largely gut-instinct-driven ship owners that they need to get religion. Be honest, that's not really where you thought this podcast would end up, did you? Anyway, my thanks to Martin and Siri for their time in the fascinating discussion this week. Um, congratulations also to Siri on the Anassis Prize. I should point out that Siri was actually one of three recipients. Uh, Professor Daryl Duffy uh, of Stanford University was given the Finance Award and Professor Mark Mellitz of Harvard was honoured for his work on international trade. Congratulations to them both. Thank you also to Professor Gramenos of the Bayes Business School for a genuinely insightful couple of days and uh, allowing me to listen in to the cleverest people in the business. And thank you, as ever, for listening. Um, we're going to be climbing down from our ivory tower of academia next week and rejoining you proles in the dirty daily business of the market. Until then, though, have a good week. Bye. Bye.